tonight. Farmer feud. Indian farmers take to the streets in the latest round of protests against unfair crop prices set by Modi's government, causing crucial upsets just months away from national elections. Pushing for peace. US President Joe Biden calls for a pause in conflict in Gaza with what seems to be newfound sympathy for refugees caught in the crossfire. No way home. South Carolina seems to be in the bag for Donald Trump as new polls show Nikki Haley left in the dust despite the mounting legal troubles. And puppy love. Yoga enthusiasts find their perfect match this Valentine's Day at Pups and Poses. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. Thank you very much for tuning in. Well, this Tuesday night is quite an eventful one, from the push for peace in Israel to Trump's complete domination of South Carolina polls. But first, we head to neighboring India, where protests run rampant tonight. Indian police fired tear gas shells at crowds of protesting farmers as they began their march to New Delhi to protest crop prices. The march, the latest in a series of such protests going back more than two years, comes months ahead of national elections in which Prime Minister Narendra Modi will seek a third term with farmers forming an influential voting bloc. Farm unions hope to force the government to make a law committing to provide higher state support or price guarantees and honour promises to double farmers' income. Security in the capital was tightened after farm unions from northern states called for protests. It came a day after talks with ministers failed to secure minimum prices for a range of crops. Police fired tear gas to disperse marchers about 140 miles north of Delhi and where many had joined the march. The country's agriculture minister told reporters after talks with union leaders that some issues had been resolved but more talks were needed. Police have now prohibited large gatherings in New Delhi. They've also blocked sections of major routes leading to the capital from Punjab. The government announces minimum prices for more than 20 crops each year. But state agencies only buy rice and wheat at these prices, which benefits just around 6% of farmers. And now an update on Israel's war with Gaza. Following the heavy attacks on Rafah by Israel just a day earlier, US President Biden is beginning to grow exasperated with advances made by Israel and stated that he is doing his utmost to push for a pause of about six weeks in the conflict. However, the deal seems slow to come into fruition. They need to be protected. U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday stressed the need to protect innocent civilians in Gaza after scores of Palestinians were killed in the southern city of Rafah during an Israeli military operation that freed two hostages held by Hamas. The speech alongside Jordan's King Abdullah at the White House comes as Biden has become increasingly vocal in his demand that Israel not undertake a ground offensive in Rafah without a plan that protects Palestinian civilians. Major military operation in Rafah should not proceed without a credible plan, a credible plan for ensuring the safety and support of more than one million people sheltering there. Many people there have been displaced, displaced multiple times, fleeing the violence to the north, and now they're packed into Rafah. Biden, who has shown increasing exasperation with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for not heeding his advice, said he and allies in the region were working, quote, day and night on a deal to pause fighting, allow hostages to be freed, and increase the flow of humanitarian assistance to Gaza. The United States is working on a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, which would bring an immediate and sustained period of calm to Gaza for at least six weeks. Sources familiar with the talks told that senior officials from the U.S., Egypt, Israel and Qatar were expected to resume negotiations on Tuesday in Cairo to work on a three-phase deal framework to release hostages and achieve an extended pause. We are still focused on trying to get an extended humanitarian pause. White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby told reporters that some progress had been made in negotiations toward a pause in fighting, 
but that more work was still needed to be done. The intensifying conflict in Rafah fueled concerns that an Israeli offensive on the southernmost pocket of Gaza could derail the hostage talks, but a U.S. official told the airstrikes in Rafah should not affect the negotiations toward a deal between Israel and Hamas on the release of hostages. It is not our assessment that this airstrike is the launch of a full-scale offensive. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said the U.S. did not think the Israeli airstrikes in Rafah were the start of a full-scale military operation in the southern Gaza city, and that without a credible plan that Israel can execute, Washington would not support one. Back in the region now, final preparations are underway in Indonesia as the country will hold a general election the next day when voters will decide on a new president and a swathe of legislative lawmakers. Three candidates are vying to succeed incumbent President Joko Widodo, better known as Jokowi, who is finishing the second of the maximum two terms allowed. Here's a look at how some candidates are employing social media to expand their outreach during these crucial hours. These Indonesian women are trying to promote presidential candidate Prabowo Subianto on TikTok. Oi, oi, oi. It's a platform all three candidates have gravitated towards as they try to reach the country's millions of young voters ahead of the February 14th election. TikTok has 125 million users in Indonesia and has become the country's second most used source of information on politics after television, according to pollster Indicator Politik Indonesia. Sibianto's rivals, Anis Baswedan and Ganjar Pranowo, have also ramped up their presence on the app, answering questions during live streams or sharing videos of heartfelt encounters with voters. But experts say TikTok is also flooded with problematic content that attempts to manipulate young voters. Enda Truastuti is a communications researcher at the University of Indonesia. She says many young voters may not be aware that Sibianto has been forced to deny allegations of human rights abuses during his time as Special Forces commander. Manipulated images and deepfake videos of the candidates have also circulated widely. TikTok says on its website its policy is to remove harmful misinformation and work with fact-checkers to flag or debunk it. Political ads and fundraising are banned. Nearly 205 million people are registered to vote as the world's third-largest democracy heads to the polls on Wednesday. In what may seem as some unsurprising news, Thailand's jailed former Prime Minister Thaksin Sinawatra will soon walk free from detention after his parole was approved, according to Thailand's Justice Minister, just six months after his dramatic return to the kingdom. The announcement caps an extraordinary decades-long political saga that will see the return of one of Thailand's most controversial political figures to everyday life. It soon became clear the returned political figure would not be spending much time behind bars. Thailand's king reduced Thaksin's prison sentence from eight years to one after the billionaire submitted a request for a royal pardon. Thailand's justice minister confirmed Thaksin is one of the 930 inmates who have been granted parole this month. Thaksin became eligible for a parole as he falls into the category of an inmate aged over 70 years old and who has a serious chronic illness. In addition, he has already served more than half of his sentence. The corrections department is working on a date for Thaksin's release. Despite his physical absence in the country, Thaksin retained an outsized influence on Thai politics and he remained at the centre of the country's tumultuous and often violent political landscape. Until last year, political parties allied to Thaksin had won more seats in every election since 2001. His release from prison, however, reintroduces a towering and a divisive figure to Thailand at a tense political time. Back in the U.S., with the South Carolina primaries looming ever closer, Trump's legal troubles seem to continue to be a thorn in the side of his political future. The former U.S. president's legal team has now asked the Supreme Court to intervene in the ruling that denies him absolute immunity. He's asking for a pause on a judicial decision, rejecting his claim he's immune from being prosecuted for trying to overturn his loss in the 2020 election. Trump's lawyers argued in a brief to the Supreme Court that without such a shield, the presidency as we know it will cease to exist. As Trump runs for re-election, his legal team are trying to get an appeals court in Washington, D.C. that rejected his claims of immunity in the federal criminal case against him. 
They want the court's full slate of judges involved rather than just a three-judge panel that made the ruling. And now they want the Supreme Court justices to pause the criminal trial proceedings while they make their case. In their brief, the lawyers painted a dark picture of what would befall future presidents if Trump's criminal prosecution is allowed to proceed, repeating warnings that have failed in other courts so far. They said, quote, the threat of prosecution will become a political cudgel used to influence the most sensitive and important presidential decisions with the menace of personal vulnerability after leaving office. In the February 6 ruling, the D.C. judges stated that the risk that former presidents will be unduly harassed by meritless federal criminal prosecutions appears slight, and said there was no functional justification for giving former presidents full protection from federal prosecution. If I don't get immunity, then crooked Joe Biden doesn't get immunity. And Trump faces four criminal trials, including two surrounding alleged efforts to overturn his election loss, one a federal case, the other at state level. In the federal case Trump is seeking immunity against, he's accused of conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring against and obstructing the congressional certification of Joe Biden's electoral victory, and conspiring against the right of Americans to vote. Prosecutors argue that Trump was acting as a candidate, not a president, when he pressured officials to overturn the election results and encouraged his supporters to march to the Capitol on January 6, 2021, to push Congress not to certify Biden's win. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with news on how the South Carolina primaries are faring and how the world reacted to Trump's NATO remarks. Stay tuned. Welcome back. On the road to the White House now, despite the legal turmoil, former President Donald Trump remains the huge favorite to defeat former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley in her home state. This is according to a new poll. The polls show that the former president is favored by 65% of South Carolinans likely to vote in the state's primary, while Haley is the choice of just 30% of voters. Trump voters seemed less willing to change their vote, with only 13% saying they might switch preferences, compared to 22% for Haley. 82% of GOP voters said they approved of Trump's performance as president, while 60% were satisfied with Haley's tenure as governor. A majority of 75% said that Haley, being from South Carolina, made no difference in their choice of candidates, with 20% saying that they were more likely to vote for the former governor as a result, and 5% saying they were less likely. While nearly half of the GOP voters reportedly identified themselves as members of Trump's MAGA movement, 76% said that Haley was not also part of the movement. Just 23% of Trump voters said that the former president's ongoing legal troubles were a valid reason to consider Haley. He's not qualified to be the president of the United States. With early voting now underway in South Carolina, Nikki Haley is launching her strongest attacks yet on former President Donald Trump. Well, I think the polls are the same that we saw in New Hampshire. And I moved 25 points in the last three weeks of the race. You can look at any poll you want, but the reality is this is when they are starting to pay attention. I'm prepared to continue to go Michigan to Super Tuesday. Why don't we let that happen? Haley slammed Trump for saying over the weekend that he would not protect NATO allies from a Russian attack if they failed to contribute enough financially to the alliance. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. Trump has long criticized NATO, but these remarks drew outrage from the White House, though Republican allies on Capitol Hill came to his defense. I learned a long time ago not to overreact to what President Trump says or what he tweets. Russia has never invaded a NATO country because Russia is intimidated by that alliance. Why would you go and put that alliance in harm's way? And she called Trump unhinged for mocking her husband, Michael, an officer in the National Guard. Where is he? He's gone. You're going to mock my husband who's deployed 8,000 miles away? What does that say about someone who wants to be commander in chief? Because as a military spouse, it makes me worry about Michael's safety. As someone who was in national security, it makes me worry about the future for our kids with him starting a war.
Now an update to the growing backlash on Trump's NATO remarks. European leaders have called for greater unity and military cooperation across the continent. Donald Tusk, Poland's prime minister, said on a visit to Paris that there was no alternative to the EU and the Transatlantic Alliance before a summit in which he discussed deepening defense relationships with the French President Emmanuel Macron. He said, as Putin and Trump threaten from East and West, Europe must stand up for itself. We have other than a world news special correspondent, Shanika Dharmarakna in Vietpesk, Belarus, with the latest. Shanika? Yes, Anuradhi. Some European leaders were openly critical of Trump. On a visit to Cyprus, Germany's president said, these statements are not responsible and they help Russia. Others were more nuanced. David Cameron, the UK Foreign Secretary, said Trump's remarks were unhelpful. There was a more sympathetic response from an EU neighbour of Russia. Estonia's Prime Minister said he thinks what the presidential candidate in America said is also something to, something to maybe wake up some of the allies who haven't done that much. Tusk, who leads the NATO country, with the highest proportion of defence spending said, the European Union, France and Poland become a strong and ready to defend their own borders and to defend and support our allies and friends from outside the Union. The French President said, France and Poland would negotiate a new treaty covering defence, energy and cultural issues and that Europe needed to increase the production of arms for Ukraine. Weapons manufacturing would build up Europe's industrial base and military role, Macron said, and will also make it possible to make Europe a security and defence power complementary to NATO, mm. the European pillar of Atlantic Alliance. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Shanika Dharmaratna in Vietbest, Belarus. On the flip side of the coin, we have the Kremlin responding to the NATO remarks with no comment. What they did give information on, however, are the recent Starlink usage allegations by Ukraine's military strongly denying the technology's involvement in war efforts. Other than as Minoli Zagaria in Kursk, Russia has the details. Minoli. Yes, Anuradi. The Kremlin declined to comment on remarks made by former US President Donald Trump about not protecting NATO allies which fail to spend enough on their own defense from a potential Russian invasion. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said he is still Putin's press secretary but not Trump's. Meanwhile, Ukraine is accusing Russian forces of obtaining Starlink satellite terminals illicitly from third countries and increasing their use on the front line. The Kremlin responded by saying Starlink was neither certified for using nor officially supplied to Russia and therefore could not be used. The agency further st stated Russia was increasing Starlink use on the front line and that work was underway to stop Russian forces using the terminals to coordinate attacks in occupied parts of Ukraine. The high-speed satellite internet terminals are produced by Elon Musk SpaceX. Starlink says it does not do business of any kind with Russia's government or military. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria in Kursk, Russia. Thanks again. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. If small acts of kindness can speak in insurmountable volume, then just how loud will the kindness of generosity ring? One kind stranger's good deed of giving back has blessed the lives of many at one quaint cafe in Michigan. Take a look. When you get the check at a local restaurant or cafe, how much do you tip? Yes, well, right. Some joints will give you a hint, suggesting 20, 22, or even 25%. But last week, one patron at the Mason Jar Cafe in Southwest Michigan showed some gratitude on another order of magnitude, tipping $10,000 on a $32 lunch. Absolute disbelief to begin with. Typically, we'll see, you know, every now and then $100, um, but not ever anything, you know, of this gratitude or, or magnitude. 
Manager Tim Sweeney was shocked to see this kind of tip especially during the cafe's slow winter months. I had conversation with him and he wanted to proceed. Turns out this act of kindness was far from random. It was in memory of a friend who had recently passed and he was in town for a funeral. Um, and it was just really an act of kindness that impacted so many people. The customer, who wished to remain anonymous, requested the tip be split among the staff. Waitress Paige Mullick says she'll use her share to help pay off some of her student loans. Lower that interest every bit I can. <laughs> we had so many incredible women working that day, so many hardworking mothers, just who, who really deserve this. The cafe is sharing this picture of the tip on Facebook with the caption, I'm crying, you're crying, we're all crying. Adding, quote, keep sharing the love where you can. Every dollar counts at a job like this, and I think that a lot of people really, really deserve this. If a little bit goes a long way, a big tip like this has the potential to change lives. Anytime you can lend a hand and change somebody's life, um, whether it's a, a small act or a large act, it's very important to just keep that in the forefront, um, keep that top of mind. And finally tonight, yoga enthusiasts in India's capital, New Delhi, got an extra dose of puppy cuteness during their yoga class ahead of this year's Valentine's Day. Pose and Poses, which specializes in yoga sessions paired with dogs across India, held a Valentine's Day themed course featuring 11 rescue puppies, including golden retrievers and a Shih Tzu, which are all up for adoption. Participants exclaimed that while it was their first time at such an event, they have most certainly found their perfect Valentine. The session lasted for about an hour and was open to couples and singles alike. While some hardline Hindu group protest against celebrations of St. Valentine's Day in India, the year's most romantic day has become increasingly popular, especially in urban areas led by retailers who had jumped onto the bandwagon. Well, I guess they found their perfect partners just in time for Valentine's tomorrow. Or should I say, perfect. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this Tuesday night. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. See you again next time. Have a good night.